Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's a robust uh, good morning. Let's try it again. <coughs> One, two, three. Good morning. That's the good morning. I'm looking at how I yelled Miss Carolyn Telk is a wonderful person to be a part of the senior, a part of the part of seniors program. She has an hilarious personality. She will enlighten the room, and so I'm so glad to see that you're present today. Thanks. So at this time, is introductions of you all. Starting with, let's pass the mic. I'm Julie Hall. Marietta Monroe. Ernestine Newsom. Francine William. Excuse me, Henry Abbott. Good in here. Mr. Onisimus. <laughs> Shirley Whitmore. Carolyn Belk. Maxine Gregory. Good morning, Sharon Parker. Brenda Kennedy. Kamea Underwood. The two ladies in the back, they will uh, be following Dr. Wilson's presentation and they will also be presenting today. Thank you ladies for coming. Now it's time for introductions. Dr. Philip Wilson III was born and raised in Jefferson City, Missouri. He obtained his Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Missouri. He completed medical school at Andrew Taylor Steele's University in Kirksville, Missouri, and internship in internal medicine at the University of Missouri Hospital and Clinics. Dr. Wilson's ophthalmology residency was at the Mason Eye Institute, University of Missouri Columbia, where he served as chief resident. Currently, he is in private practice at the Jefferson City Medical Group, Ophthalmology. He has been involved in multiple research projects and publications. His practice interest includes diagnosis as well as medical and surgical treatment of diseases of the eye with emphasis on cataracts, muscular degeneration, and glaucoma. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Philip Wilson III. Thank you so much for that introduction. It seems so formal. Uh, first, I want to thank you for letting me uh, come to talk today. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity. You know, glaucoma is, is, is something I'm passionate about, and it's extremely common, and I venture to guess most people in the room, at least if they don't have glaucoma, they know someone close to them that does. It's a pretty common thing, and uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, confusion in the community about it that I find with patients. So hopefully today's talk will be able to um, kind of clear up some of that confusion. Uh, you know, the intent isn't to cover everything about glaucoma, but just to kind of cover the, the main points and, and what I think is important. Uh, I did actually shorten it up a little bit uh, so that we should have plenty of time for questions and, and answers after the presentation, so feel free to, to fire away once we finish the talk, okay? I always like to start out with a joke, and so it, it's pretty corny, but why are eye doctors so smart? Because they're good pupils. <laughs> uh, currently at, at JCMG, there's uh, three uh, board certified ophthalmologists there, myself included, and you can see my father here in the middle with his old mustache that he no longer has, which I think is a funny <laughs> picture. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of confusion in the community just about what is an ophthalmologist, what is an optometrist, what's the difference? Just to kind of hopefully clarify that somewhat right off the bat, we're, we're both eye doctors. Um, the difference being that it, ophthalmologists go through four years of medical school. So um, both of us, we do undergraduate and then optometrists go to three years of optometry school and then they're done. For myself and my partners, our path was undergraduate, four years of medical school. 
and then we do an internship year, uh, usually in internal medicine where we just learn to be an internal medicine doctor in general, and then three more years in ophthalmology eyes alone where we also get to learn how to do surgery on the eye. Uh, we're capable to, to you know, do the glasses and contacts and the standard exams, but we also do more with the surgical side of things as well. So sometimes it's easy to simplify things. What is glaucoma? We've got a normal eye here, and then here's your eye with glaucoma. <laughs> and uh <-huh>. <laughs> in, all, <laughs> um, in all seriousness, though, it really it is a, 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 a very debilitating disease for some people. It's actually the second leading cause of blindness in the United States. So that's significant. And in the United States, it's the number one cause of irreversible blindness. So this is a very common disease. Uh, we see it all the time. Roughly 2% of the population over the age of 40, and we expect that to increase to you know almost uh, 3.4 million by the year 2020. So that's a lot of people. And as you can imagine, there's a significant uh, cost and burden on, on patients and, and healthcare alike. Really, you know, glaucoma is actually a group of diseases. Uh, they all lead to kind of a typical progressive damage of the optic nerve, right? And that's the cable cord between the eye and the brain. Um, typically, they're going to be related to a high pressure in the eye, okay? Um, it's an intraocular pressure. And the scariest thing about it is usually there's no symptoms until the disease is very advanced. Um, we can't reverse anything that happens from glaucoma. Damage to your vision or to your optic nerve is irreversible from glaucoma. So the important thing is that we catch it early and we prevent it from getting worse. Okay, so that's going to be like the key theme to this whole presentation. There's a bunch of different types of glaucoma and to kind of discuss them individually is outside the scope of today's uh, uh, lecture. But you know, the most common being primary open angle glaucoma. And in the United States, that's roughly 90% of glaucoma. Uh, and that's kind of what we're gonna focus on today. I'll touch a little bit on the other, uh, other types, but uh, in general, when I'm talking about risk and, and things like that, we're talking about the open angle, the most common form, okay? So just as a kind of a, a brief idea of what's actually happening. So I've got a diagram of the front part of the eye, right? This is a, a cross section, a side view of the eye, okay? This is the, the clear windshield of the eye, the cornea. This is the anterior chamber we call the space in front of the eye. This is actually the pupil here, and we have the lens that sits back here. And the back part of the eye is full of a thick jelly, and that's not really depicted in this uh, image, but that jelly is a kind of an impermeable uh, membrane there, so it's not something that um, really plays a major role in glaucoma. Suffice to say that it's just a separate compartment of the eye. But in the front part of the eye, there's a fluid that's made, and we call it the aqueous humor. It's basically essentially water, but it has some other things that are, are good for the eye, bathes the inside of the eye, allows the eye to get nutrition and things like that. It's made back here at this area near the lens behind the colored part of the eye, the iris, called the ciliary body. This fluid is always being made no matter what, okay? And this fluid has to drain out of the eye. And to do that, the majority of it has to go out here to what we call the angle of the eye in this area here, if you can see that where my pointer's at, hopefully. Um, this is where at least 60% of the fluid that is made exits the eye, okay? In open angle glaucoma, the fluid has no problem getting to this drain, but somewhere deep within that drain, there's a blockage, okay? And we don't fully understand what causes it or, you know, how it happens, but that's where the problem is. And so that drain's not working, but the eye continues to make fluid. And so what happens, the fluid builds up pressure. And that pressure actually transmits to the back part of the eye and damages the nerve in the back of the eye, okay? That's kind of the gist of what happens. Another relatively common type of glaucoma that's different than open angle is called closed angle. And then this type of glaucoma, the problem isn't the fluid drain itself, but it's the fluid not being able to reach that drain, okay? There's different reasons that can happen. 
One is just the shape of the eye. You know, just like everybody is a different size, everybody's eye is a different size. Some people that have smaller than average eyes that causes a crowding of this angle of the eye here where the fluid can't reach out to that drain, okay? And, you know, other times inflammation can do it and this area actually scars shut. So then that fluid can't get to that drain so it's trapped. It causes the pressure to go up. The result is the same but the treatments are a little bit different depending on what type of glaucoma you have. Again, we're gonna be talking about open angle, we call it primary open angle glaucoma or POAG, basically for the rest of the talk. Um, here's our, our risk factors, and the number one thing that I want you to take away as far as risk factors go is increased pressure within the eye, okay? Also to note, that's the only risk factor on this list that we can actually control. Okay? It is a disease typically of older age. Okay? So it's much more common when we get in our 50s and 60s than say when our 30s. It can happen when you're younger. That's, that is a possibility, but it's less likely. We know from many studies that family history is a major risk factor. And we're not talking about distant, distant relatives, but primary relatives like parents or siblings, okay? Um, it is much more common and much more severe in certain ethnicities. And the biggest ones are African Americans or Caribbean descent. Uh, that includes Hispanics as well. And people of Asian descent are also at increased risk for different types of glaucoma. Um, one that we call normal tension glaucoma. Um, there are associations with people who are nearsighted. That means you are able to see up close fairly well, but you can't see very well far away. And that's a, a lot of people. But that risk is slightly increased for those individuals for developing glaucoma. Some studies also suggest that there's a correlation with diabetes. Uh, and we know that a thin cornea, that's the clear windshield of the eye, is bad when it comes to glaucoma. Okay, we don't really know why that is, but that's just something that we found. Here's another uh, image just trying to depict a little bit what we were talking about earlier. Again, the fluid is made back here and it goes out to the angle here where it's drained. If that drain isn't working for whatever reason, that fluid pressure builds up and it transmits back to the back of the eye and damages this nerve. Again, that damage is permanent. Okay, typically, it's gonna affect your peripheral vision first before your central vision. That's also why most people don't even know it's happening. It's a very slow process and you know you don't really realize you're missing some of this peripheral vision. So being that it's asymptomatic, how do we catch it? Uh, and the key here is the routine eye exam. Okay? Most of the time when you get your eyes checked, they're gonna check the pressure in your eye. Okay. And that's very important when it comes to glaucoma. Dilated eye exams are also very important. And I wanted to stress this during the, my talk today is not every eye exam has a dilated exam, right? Most of the time, if you're just gonna go to you know, a quick place, say Walmart, to check your glasses, they're actually not gonna dilate you. So it is possible that they could be missing signs of glaucoma during those exams. So it's important that you have a full comprehensive exam that includes dilation. A really important test again is to test that peripheral vision. We use uh, what we call a visual field testing machine. Just going to touch on this briefly at the bottom. There are some people out there, pretty commonly, that show some signs of glaucoma but not others. Okay, and it can be tricky to decide: is this glaucoma or is this just a normal variant? Because there's a lot of variation in people's eyes. Those people, we call them glaucoma suspect, okay? And when we are worried that maybe these are some signs of glaucoma, typically all we need to do is watch you more frequently. Repeat the test, okay? Glaucoma is a progressive disease. It will get worse. And if we keep bringing you back and keep checking, we'll catch any changes and then we say, this is glaucoma, let's start treatment, okay? We define a, a normal eye pressure as between 10 and 21, okay? There's different ways we can measure the pressure, and some of you probably have this, you know, there's the air puff machine, and, and 
a little what we call a tonal pin where they hold a little pin and tap it on the eye and another way where it's attached to actually our microscope um, they all work pretty well and especially for screening purposes and most of the time in an eye exam you're going to get that done but I want to stress that the eye pressure actually changes throughout the day okay? it's not always the same it goes up and down and just because when they test it at the visit it's normal doesn't mean it's necessarily normal when you go home or the next day okay to make it even more confusing confusing there are some people that still have glaucoma yet every time we check their pressure it's normal okay and we call that low tension or normal tension glaucoma okay on top of that there are people that have high eye pressures that never develop glaucoma okay but what's important about that is when the pressure in your eye is high your risk of developing glaucoma is many many times more than the average person okay one of the things that we look at is the optic nerve what we call cupping or thinning during a dilated exam this cartoon is showing you different pictures of what basically what the optic nerve looks like okay we look in the back of the eye and there's all this nerve tissue that runs as this nerve tissue meets up it forms this kind of yellowish circle that's called the optic disc okay that nerve tissue then dives out of the eye exits out of the eye and when it leaves the eye it leaves a little uh, indentation or depression called the optic cup and that's what this smaller circle is trying to depict here, okay? Most people, the ratio between this depression and this whole optic disc is less than 50%. So again, this cup usually takes up less than 50% of all this area of the disc. In early glaucoma, it looks more like this picture, where you can see this cup, all of a sudden, it's taking up almost half the area of this disc. When glaucoma gets worse, that cup gets even larger, and the disc gets even thinner as far as the margins from here to here. It progresses down to where there's almost no disc left, and all you have is a big hollow spot. When you get to this point, most people are going to have severe vision loss. Okay? It's pretty common that someone comes in and, and like this picture up here at the top right-hand side, has a cup it's a little bit bigger than average okay that's when we aren't sure is this early glaucoma or is this just the way your optic nerve looks because some people that's how their optic nerve is and has been their whole life so those are the people that we call glaucoma suspect and they're people that are really important that we watch closer so that their nerve doesn't start to look like this or this or even worse a critical test for glaucoma is a peripheral vision test okay and we just call it visual field testing and nowadays we do it in a computerized system and that's what this is showing it's like a machine that you just simply put your chin and forehead into you can see he's got a little clicker in his hand and that machine will flash lights in your peripheral vision and when you see those lights you're supposed to click the button okay and that can map out your peripheral vision and tell us are there big missing sections or were you able to see the lights in your peripheral vision most people with glaucoma, I like to repeat this test at least once a year to make sure it's not getting worse. Okay? This shows us what this visual field printout looks like. The one at the top is a normal visual field. Okay? It does have a dark spot where the patient wasn't able to see the light, but this is actually the normal blind spot that everybody has here. Okay? In glaucoma, Early on, you'll see loss of this peripheral vision with dark spots kind of at the edge of this visual field test. As the disease gets worse, you can see the darkness is kind of coming in closer on the vision until in severe glaucoma, you only have a small area left of your vision. And usually at this point, you're going to start to have problems reading, driving, watching TV, those kinds of things. There's another test that many of you may have heard of or seen that's relatively new but very important uh, part of a glaucoma workup is called the OCT and it's a machine that it's really revolutionized ophthalmology in the last oh, 10 or 15 years 
and it actually can measure very precisely the thickness of that optic nerve in the back of your eye. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this picture is trying to show, this is exactly what our printout in the office looks like too, but you can see the difference between this eye, the right eye, and the picture in this left eye. And it gives us readouts, and you can see how all these readouts in the right eye are in red. Okay? That right eye has a fair amount of thinning uh, due to glaucoma, whereas this left eye does not. This test is great because we can repeat it and very accurately and precisely compare changes over time. If you do have glaucoma, typically over the course of a year or two, you will get increased thinning. And so if we repeat this test every six months or every year, we can track the disease to see, is, are things getting worse? Is that nerve getting thinner? Or is it doing great? Is it staying the same thickness? We have a, a lot of treatment options for glaucoma these days, um, but you know, kind of simply put, there's three different ways we do it, and one's with medications that typically consist of eye drops, um, laser procedures that I'm going to talk just briefly about, and actually surgical procedures that I'm going to very briefly talk about. All of these treatments have one goal, and that's to lower the pressure in the eye. That's the only way we can slow glaucoma down. And that's been shown over and over in major studies. Okay. Usually, the, there are pills. Uh, people ask me this all the time. Does it have to be eye drops to lower the pressure? Are there any pills? There are some pills, but the problem is they don't work well long term. They have a lot of side effects. We do use them if people have high eye pressure that we can't control, especially if we're planning on just getting them to surgery in a few weeks or something like that to get them by short term. Uh, but that's not a good fix. So as far as medication, the best thing is drops, okay? At the bottom here is this kind of an important thing too is certain types of treatment, certain medications, certain lasers, certain surgeries work better for certain types of glaucoma than others, okay? To get into that is outside the scope of this talk again, but um, just keep that in mind, and that'll be a discussion, you know, that you have with your eye doctor, which is going to work best for me and my glaucoma. Most of the time, when we put people on drops, they need to be on them long term, okay? Even, you know, for the rest of their life. The exception is, if we start them out on medication and say we end up doing a surgery down the road. A lot of times with the surgery, we can get you off drops, okay? but some people need to be on them forever. There's only about four or five different types of eye drops that we even have in our arsenal. Some of them, you just have to take one drop once a day, which isn't too bad. Others, you have to take up to three or more times a day, depending on the situation. Um, usually people do great with the drops, uh, but some people can get kind of reactions to them, irritation of the eye, they can get what we call hypersensitivity, not a true allergy, but where that drop starts to cause a lot of irritation. And in those patients, we have to consider other options, either switching to a different type of drop, consider doing a laser surgery, or an incisional surgery. This is just a picture I pulled off glaucoma.org that uh, kind of depicts uh, the way that we recommend you putting the drop in. And I always tell patients that when you're looking right at that drop coming at your eye, it's hard. <laughs> so the trick is to not look at the drop, and instead of putting it right on the center of your eye, put it down in this lower part, which this picture of the guy doesn't even do a great job, but I would recommend aiming in this little lower part here. Pull down on that eyelid with your head back, put the drop in like that. <coughs> There's a laser that I've gotten um, great results with that uh, I use very frequently in the clinic. Um, it has improved over time to where it's pretty much uh, completely painless, it's very safe and very effective. We do it in the clinic. It only takes, you know, five minutes or so to do the procedure. And, you know, in the past we kind of saved the laser uh, until, you know, we tried some drops, they weren't working, then we recommend laser. But often now, I, I go to this laser the first thing, because drops aren't fun to be on. 
I wanted to touch on this because I always get questions about lasers and what types of lasers there are. For people with open angle glaucoma, I use this selective laser trabeculoplasty. That's a SLT laser. But there's a different type of laser we do for people who have angle closure glaucoma. And again, in these people, the drain is kind of pinched shut for whatever reason. The fluid can't get out to that drain. And so what we do is we use a laser, we actually punch a little hole way out here in the edge of the colored part of the eye, the iris, to allow that fluid to have a bypass way to get straight to that drain. And under a microscope, you can see that little hole. But with the naked eye, you usually can't see it at all. Again, <laughs> Yeah, you hate to have a drain showing from your eye. Yeah, you just really, you don't see it, you know, and, and it's really small. Um, as far as surgery, usually that's kind of the last uh, tool we pull out of the toolbox, so to speak. Because people don't want to go through surgery unless they have to. But the reality is, we've gotten great with it, and people do really well. There's been uh, amazing advances uh, in what we call a minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, MIGS, M-I-G-S for short, in the past 10 years, where the side effects are very low, the surgery is very easy, and they work really well. The kind of old tried and true standby, if you will, surgery of last resort is called a trabeculectomy. And I just want to discuss this too because people have a lot of confusion about what that is. And what we actually do is we make an opening from the inside part of the eye to underneath the skin on the outside part of the eye for that fluid to drain. I've got a little picture that kind of shows it. So what we do is we lift up the skin of the eye, the conjunctiva, peel it back, and we have to make an opening in the wall of the eye, the white part of the eye called the sclera, and that opening communicates with the front part of the eye where that fluid is and not draining, it allows that fluid to come out underneath the skin of the eye and drain back behind the eye. Most studies suggest that we want to lower the pressure in the eye by about 20 to 30 percent once we're diagnosed with glaucoma. If we can do that, most people's glaucoma won't get worse. And so that's, you know, a very attainable goal. One of the hardest parts is we don't know what pressure is going to be good for each patient. Some people, we only need to get the pressure down to 20. Other people, we have to get it down to 10. So there's no way of telling that unless we have to bring you in frequently to make sure it's not getting worse. And so follow-up is one of the biggest issues we have. We need to bring you back. We need to repeat the tests. We need to check that the pressures are still good and check that your peripheral vision is still good. You know, if your pressures are so-so and the peripheral vision is getting worse, then of course we have to lower the pressure even further, okay? That can be burdensome, you know. Uh, even a lot of docs with mild glaucoma, it has to be every six months that we check on you. With severe glaucoma, some doctors will see you every couple of months. So that's a lot of doctor visits, and that gets difficult. But that's the best way we have to, to slow it down and make sure it's not getting worse. Again, compliance is key in glaucoma. The biggest challenge is, you know, are patients actually coming in to see the doctor? Are patients actually getting the drops in? Are you forgetting? You know, are you having a hard time with the drops? Um, if you do these things, it's very unlikely that you'll ever go blind. You know, if you're seeing the doctor, if you're using the drops, the vast majority of people do great. So that's the good news. The American Academy of Ophthalmology has some recommendations for screening exams to you know, check for these things and for glaucoma. And it recommends that everyone by the age of 40 should have a comprehensive eye exam. That includes with dilation, okay? Um, for people that are higher risk, including people of African or Caribbean descent or Hispanic descent, or people that have a family history of glaucoma, you should actually be getting checked you know, every couple of years before the age of 40 and after every year. 
So just to kind of summarize, glaucoma is, is the second most common cause of blindness in the United States. Okay? Most people will never know they have symptoms until it's too late, so to speak. It's much more common and much more difficult to treat in people of African or Caribbean descent. Okay? Prevention is the whole key because, again, we can't reverse the damage from glaucoma. All we can do is prevent more damage from occurring. S can't stress enough, that's how we find it, the comprehensive eye exams. Okay? And if you happen to be an unfortunate individual that is diagnosed, use your drops, go to the eye doctor, and you'll do really well. There's a lot of good uh, resources, and it usually just takes a, an internet search to find them. But, you know, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, there's glaucoma.org and, and European societies that I was looking at some before I did this presentation. They really have good information and, you know, things about how to do the drops, you know, when do I need to see the eye doctor, it's all there. One more joke here to finish up. Why did the phone wear glasses? Because it lost all of its contacts. <laughs> really cheesy jokes today. I'd like to uh, go ahead and open up for questions and, and feel free to, to fire away. Questions? Uh, what causes floaters in your eyes? That's a really very good question, very common question. What causes floaters in the eyes? So, let me see, I can go back to this picture here. So, the back of the eye, if you'll just look at this top eye, is full of this thick, very sticky jelly. It's called the vitreous, okay? As time goes on and we get older, that vitreous breaks down. And when it does that, it actually pulls away from the inside wall of the eye, separates. When it pulls away, it will pull a superficial layer of tissue from the retina with it. Okay? That little piece of tissue doesn't harm the retina, but it is not clear. And it sits in that jelly, suspended, floating around. <clears throat> Most people usually only notice it uh, in certain lighting conditions and uh, you know sometimes it kind of floats out of the way and comes back in the way usually they're not dangerous but I'll tell you that anybody that gets new onset of floaters floaters that weren't there before should have a dilated eye exam because rarely when that jelly pulls away from the retina it can actually pull a tear in that retina um, that is not common but about 10 to 15 percent of the time that occurs and you know a tear in a retina can become a retinal detachment, which needs surgery. So if you get a whole bunch of new floaters that weren't there, it's always a good idea to come in. One other thing that happens in people that have diabetic eye disease, um, there's often bleeding inside the eye. And when you get blood in that same jelly cavity, the vitreous, it looks like cobwebs everywhere. And those are also floaters, but you know, so that's why if we get new floaters, we should have them checked out. But the run of the mill floaters, they're not anything dangerous. They, they are a nuisance. There's not necessarily an easy fix for them. But most people get by pretty well, and over time, they notice them less. Oh, okay. Go ahead. What causes, uh, uh, I'm a diabetic, and a lot of times I see flashes of light. There are, a, there are a number of causes of flashes of lights, okay? Usually when you're getting flashes of light, it could be a sign that something is pulling on your retina. For instance, the jelly in the back of the eye is trying to separate from that retina, and every time that jelly pulls on the retina, you see a flash of light. That retina, it can't feel pain. All it can do is perceive light. So anything like that jelly pulling on it, Will cause a flash. That's the most common thing. <clears throat> Oftentimes, a flash, it kind of goes along with a new floater. And so I don't know if you've seen new floaters since you've seen the flash, but um, that's not uncommon. Anytime you're having a flash of light, same thing kind of goes. You should have an eye exam to look in the back to make sure that you haven't developed a tear in your retina. Most of the time, you don't, but it's important that you have it checked. 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I had uh, an optometrist uh, uh, say they were concerned about the, um, the vascularity in the back of my eye. They thought that it might uh, show signs of increased risk of stroke. And then I went to an ophthalmologist and he said, no, it's okay. So I just, can you talk about that a little bit? Please? Well, so strokes, um, there's, there's different, different things that maybe the, the optometrist saw that maybe led him to believe that. One is sometimes we can actually see when we look into the blood vessels in the back of the eye, a little blockage. And that's what a stroke is. It's just occurring in the eye. So it's possible maybe they saw that. Uh, when you have a stroke, oftentimes too, you can get some damage to that optic nerve. And it's possible that maybe that's what he thought he saw. Um, but, you know, usually, you know, you're not going to be able to, to, to say definitively if a person's not at risk for a stroke by looking at their eyes. You could have a normal eye exam and still have a stroke the next day. You know, that's kind of the, the bottom line. But, yeah, we can often see little blockages of the blood vessels inside the eye. And when I see those, I do recommend that people ch have their vessels checked to make sure they're not blocked. You know, they can just do a little ultrasound. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, I, if I see a little blockage or if people are having vision that kind of comes, comes and goes out completely, comes back a few minutes later, then that's a good test to make sure you aren't going to develop a stroke. Go ahead. I have a question about my peripheral vision. Sure. Uh, I don't know whether it's just me or something. Mm -hmm. When I'm driving, mm -hmm. it's like when I try to park, I'm always farther away from the curb than what I think I am. Mm -hmm. What could that be related to? Well, it's, it's hard to say. It could be a number of different things. Uh, one is it could just be some cataract that is growing in your eyes. Um, everyone gets cataracts eventually. There's nothing yeah. to be really scared about. But it does affect your visions in, in weird ways like that. <clears throat> could even be that maybe your eyes aren't lining up perfectly well. I don't know if you ever have problems with double vision or anything like that. When the eyes don't line up perfectly well, it can throw off your depth perception and things like that. Um, but it could even be, you know, peripheral vision loss from glaucoma or from something else. There's really no way to, to be sure unless you have a full, full eye exam and we can kind of rule some of those things out. I have a question. <clears throat> My uh, sister, she, um, we're close in age, but I'm older than she is. And um, she was asking me a question about cataract, cataracts. And she said, uh, uh, my doctor, you know, was telling me that she had formed cataracts. And she said, have you ever got any form of signs of cataract? And I said, well, I have a yearly checkup. Mm -hmm. And my doctor said mine is way on down yeah. the road later, and uh, but she had her her eye doctor was sticking needles in her eye, mm -hmm. and I told her I had never I've <laughs> heard of laser, yeah. you know, but not sure. needles. Yeah. Can you explain yeah. that? There's actually a, a number of different reasons we might have to inject medication inside the eye. Okay. And uh, that sounds horrible. I mean, <laughs> cross my heart and hope to die kind of thing, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but really, people do pretty well with it. The most common reasons we have to inject medication inside the eye is because there's swelling or bleeding in the back of the eye. Okay. Okay. A lot of different things can cause it. Diabetes, mm -hmm. macular degeneration, yeah. um, you know, uh, if you've had a little blockage in a blood vessel in the back of the eye, all those things. Yeah. And so it's hard to say. Sometimes doing things like that, injecting medication inside the eye, although very safe, can actually speed the growth of a cataract up. And so I'm suspicious that maybe that's what happened to your sister. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back to the floaters. Do they ever go away? I had one 
But now I don't see it anymore. Yeah. So I just thought, well, maybe it's laying down in some corner. No? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that happens. Uh, I think sometimes it it floats out of uh, your center part of your vision. Mm -hmm. I think that also they become uh, <clears throat> less opaque where they're a little smaller and clearer so you don't notice them as much too. And I think also that your brain actually learns to ignore them. Just like you have a natural blind spot, your brain kind of just says, forget that floater. But that process, it takes months usually. Um, most of the time they don't go away completely. They're still in there somewhere, just less than that. Yeah, yeah, right. That can actually happen. Yeah. What causes a, a wrinkle retina? Yeah. Sure. Uh, usually, it's something that we call an epiretinal membrane. Okay, and that's basically scar tissue that grows across the the retina. The retina is a the layer of nerve tissue in the eye, right? And it's supposed to lay flat. When you get scar tissue that grows on it, it kind of pulls it up and contracts it. And that causes it to wrinkle. And what that will do visually is give you distortion in your vision. Where you look at like a telephone pole and instead of being straight up and down, it's got a little crook in it. Um, that's one thing. Swelling can too, you know, from diabetes and macular degeneration. But a lot of times it's that scar, scar tissue. That can be related to previous history of trauma, like if you got hit in the eye when you're, you know, five years old. But sometimes it just happens, and we don't know why. But it has to be corrected by surgery. Uh, yeah, it can be corrected. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes it'll just stay like it is and won't get worse. Sometimes that scarring will get worse and it'll cause more distortion. And so when they do surgery, they go in the back part of the eye, and this is actually a retina specialist that does this. Very carefully grabs that scar tissue, peels it off the eye. And, you know, it's a good surgery, but, you know, you, you typically won't see patients go back to, you know, 20-20 vision after that surgery. And so, you know, it needs to be where it's pretty bad to make it worth doing that surgery in the first place. And glasses don't really help a lot. Not much. Not much. Not yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Will you um, revisit the high eye pressure cause, sure. please? Okay. The cause? The cause. Yeah, let me see here. So, in open angle glaucoma, again, the most common type of glaucoma, that drain that's supposed to drain that fluid off mm -hmm. stops working. Okay. We really don't know why, but it is related to genetics and age. There's certain um, pathways in that drain. And in some types of glaucoma, one pathway is worse than the other. Uh, but for the most part, suffice it to say, we don't fully understand it. But that drain just stops working. Thank you. Uh, this the topic is dry eye. If we have dry eyes, and uh, I mean, do, do, if we don't treat it, can it get worse? I mean, is this? It can. Uh, dry eye is extremely common. You know, I see whatever, if I say I see 20 patients a day, at least five to 10 of them will have some dryness. And, you know, the eye is supposed to have a, a nice healthy layer of a tear film covering it that keeps things healthy and it also helps our vision be crisp. When you get dry spots on that eye, uh, that vision's not good. And if they're bad enough, you can get little tiny ulcers, and that can get bacteria in there, and you can get infections in the eye. That's not common, uh, but usually, you know, to treat it, we just use artificial tears. And I don't like, you know, you hear a lot about Visine and stuff. No Visine. I'm not a fan, okay? Hopefully the Visine people won't see this recording. <laughs> I just like lubricating tears for that. The symptoms of dry eye are counterintuitive because the number one symptom of dry eye is actually tearing. So a lot of people might notice that. They get a lot of tearing, you know, when they're reading or driving for a long time, things get fuzzy, they have to take a break, then they can see better after they give their eyes a break. That's actually dryness. What happens is, you know, you're supposed to have a basal tear secretion where the, their tears are always being secreted. When that basal tear secretion doesn't work, your body tries to make up for it by doing reflex tears. Reflex tears are what you feel coming down your cheek. The problem is those reflex tears don't have the same good stuff that the basal tears should have. 
but that's your body's way of telling you, my eyes are dry. Okay, my daughter was born blind with glaucoma yeah. due to rubella syndrome. And so I am so familiar with everything yeah. you talked yeah. about. She's had almost every one of those surgeries, even as a baby, trabeculectomy, yeah. uh -huh. goniotomy, and yes. yeah. all those things. And then later, you know, she had a detached retina, yeah. and um, and then she developed cataracts, so she had that surgery yeah. for that. But thank God, she still has some usable vision. Yeah. It's not much, but it's there. Yeah. And um, you know, she's on three drops. Mm -hmm. and a water pill. Yeah. And, um, but she did go through a period as a child when it was in remission and she didn't have to have anything. But like now she's on these three drops and, and this water pill. Do you ever get to a point where, you know, surgery just doesn't do it anymore? You know, like... Yeah, you know... <laughs> That's a, a great question, and, and that's a, a tough situation. There's a lot of a lot of people that get glaucoma diagnosed when they're young, and it's a it's a harder thing to treat because, like we said earlier, it's a progressive disease. It will get worse. Mm -hmm. So if you're diagnosed when you're 80, you know we have to make it 10 years, and then you know we, that's doable. But when you're diagnosed when you're 10, you know you've got a lot of life to live, and so it can be hard. But there can reach a point where surgery isn't beneficial and, and can create problems. You know, just like anything in life or medicine, you got to weigh the risk and benefits. And even these safe surgeries that people do really well with, typically, they all have side effects or potential complications, even though it's a low risk. Like I always tell people, if I say, you've got a 1 in 10,000 risk of an infection after cataract surgery or less, yeah. that's a very low risk. But if you're the 1 in 10,000, you know, the risk doesn't matter too much. But, yeah, you know, there gets to be a point sometimes where the surgery, will it really help? Like I said, I'm sure she's had a fair amount of damage due to her long-term problems with this glaucoma. And, you know, by doing surgery, is that going to create more problems? Usually the answer is no, but sometimes it can be yes. And so in those cases, sometimes it's better if we're doing okay, the vision's stable. I know we're on max drops and, and even pills keep going like we are because we don't want to disturb that. Is there a chance you could still go blind from that? There's a chance, yeah. And you know, it's a horrible thing. But hopefully she won't and you know, the drops and things work uh, and, and hopefully she's seeing a glaucoma specialist for all this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have one more question. Sure. Um, I just, I, I'm um, back diagnosed with being a diabetes running in a, my mom. And so, and I got diagnosed about 10 years ago. And so, but I have a yearly checkup ever since, you know, mm -hmm. I found out. Good. Yeah, and so, but my eye doctor, on my last exam, uh, she was telling me I have a tendency of dry eyes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she told me to use warm compresses yeah uh, you know like of a morning or of an evening right retirement is that <laughs> yeah no that's a good thing um, okay yeah. when when i recommend warm compresses usually it's because there's some sort of problem with the oil glands around the eye and that's oh. one of the more common reasons you can get dry eye okay and so to help those oil glands work and kind of clean off the bacteria because what happens is those oil glands which there's about 30 in the upper eyelid 20 in the lower so there's a whole lot of them they can get clogged when we get older and that oil kind of sits there on the surface of the pore of that opening of that pore and bacteria like that and so bacteria start growing and the bacteria release toxins that make the oil glands work even worse and cause inflammation and dry the out, eye out more and so that's an important part for dry eyes to clean your eyes off. I often recommend to do it with a little bit of baby shampoo as well. Um, because if you get that in your eye, it won't hurt. And I, I probably tell patients this every day, all day, like 10 times a day. Take the wash rag, wrap it around your finger, put that baby shampoo on there, suds it up with some warm water. With your eyelid closed, you just scrub right on the margin of your eyes. You do that once a day, and that'll actually help open up some of those oil glands and get rid of some of that bacteria overgrowth related to that. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I have two. Go for it. <laughs> I like to research a lot on health, uh, you know, websites, mm -hmm. but how valid is my WebMD? Because I've been told that it should end with an edu at the end, <laughs> not .com yeah. at the end. Yeah, I think that you, you can find some good information on WebMD, but it's, it's really easy to get sidetracked and, and, you know, they kind of breeze over certain topics and, and focus on the wrong things in some situations. But I think overall you can find good stuff, but you have to be careful on the internet. Um, I put this slide here at the end. Anything from the American Academy of Ophthalmology has been reviewed by multiple eye doctors. They make sure it's the right information. You can get a lot of good patient information on that, on their web pages. Again, American Academy of Ophthalmology. I think it's AAO.com. Uh, that's a web page that I, I highly recommend for getting information about eye diseases. My other question is, of course, when I'm out there looking and reviewing different websites, I came across two different websites, and it was saying that if you have an excessive amount of cholesterol in the body, that there will be a bump or something that will come on your eyelid. How accurate is that? That's actually true. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but we see it, we see it. I mean, it doesn't, there's a lot of people that have high cholesterol that will never get those, okay? So it, you won't, you don't always get them just because your cholesterol is high. But on the flip side, some people actually get them who have normal cholesterol levels too. We just call them xanthelasmas. And they're little kind of yellow yes. bumps. You use, a lot of people have them. You probably see them. Usually don't cause a problem at all. Usually we don't have to do surgery on them or anything like that. We just notice them. Do they go away? Mm, not typically. Not typically. Okay. But they're usually pretty small. Not too noticeable. <laughs> but they won't affect your vision, right? No, they, no, they don't, don't affect your vision. I have one more question. Sure. Is it easy <laughs> Keep going, keep going. <laughs> all this puffiness under my eyes. Yeah. Is it a hereditary thing? Or is, I mean, can I guess be. it's fluid. Is yeah. That fluid? Yeah, it is. It what is. can you do about that? That's a tough one. A really tough one. Nothing. And, well, <laughs> they're studying different things. But uh, basically what happens is the eyelids here uh, underneath the eye can get this space where fluid kind of builds up as we get older. And it's usually going to be worse in the morning because we've been laying flat and then throughout the day that fluid will slowly kind of drain and gets a little better. Um, they've looked at different types of surgery for that and go in and, and try to sew that space up or <laughs> so but those are you know they, they work a little bit. Have you seen a commercial now you put this little stuff on it and it go away. I, I can't comment on that. I don't, I, I don't have any information on those things and whether or not they work. I, my suspicion is they don't, though. They have on TV. Yeah, I've seen those new ones. I, I don't know about those. But they say you can use perforation ink on it, too. It does swelling. Really? I'd be careful with that. I would suggest maybe, you know, you know, ice cubes or you put a yeah. spoon in your freezer. Yeah. And then, you know, like the boxes you use. You can do some ice. Water, that helps a little up. bit. It yeah, helps a little bit. And then even rarely um, patients, if they have big ones, we, we can put them on little water pills that kind of diuretics. That, but, you know, those have side effects and things. So most people don't really do that. But there's a doctor at, that I train with at the University of Missouri who is doing some kind of um, research surgeries for this. And we call them festoons. We don't have a good name for them. But... Uh, uh, so she's getting mixed results right now, so there's just there's not a simple fix. Another word, deal with. <laughs> Unfortunately. Thank you, Doc. Any more questions? Last chance. Okay. I have a question. Sure. We got a POB question coming up. <laughs> it's actually not. It's actually not a POB question, but it's. Um, Think about cataracts, everybody gets them, yeah. they progress at different rates. Is there anything you can do to slow down the progression of cataracts? Yes and no. Um, we know that some certain types of cataracts are related to diabetes or being on steroid medications. 
those are risk factors that we can help and modify, you know, keep the blood sugars low, avoid being on steroids when we can, if we can. Sometimes you have to go on. Um, but as far as run-of-the-mill, age-related, we don't know of anything major. Some studies have suggested maybe if we get less UV light exposure, sunlight exposure, it might slow them down. Others aren't so sure. And so it's kind of a mixed bag, but there, there have been people who said, oh, I've heard of my friend who took these drops to get rid of her cataracts. No, nothing has been successful as far as drops or, or pills or anything to slow cataracts down that I'm aware of at this point. You have to have a laser off, right? Uh, typically, we actually don't use laser for cataract surgery. You can use laser for parts of that, but uh, we actually go in and, and break that lens up with a special machine that uses sound energy breaks that natural lens up that has become hazy, removes it from the eye, and then we have to replace it with a clear artificial lens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. Any more questions? More once? Twice? All right. Please throw me in a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.